Hey, this is Rima Tay. I've got a new single out called Feels Like It's Gonna Rain. Look forward to you hearing it. And you're listening to So Booking Cool. Welcome to So Booking Cool. I'm Jewel B. Today's guest is a Berkeley music scholar, country singer, songwriter, and musician whose new single, Feels Like It's Gonna Rain, continues to climb the Music Row Country Breakout Chart. She is Re Matei. Re Matei, thanks so much for joining So Booking Cool today. I'm truly excited to have you on. How's it going? It's going great. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course, Re. So I see that you are in the Christmas spirit so far, as I'm sure many are. What would you say the holiday means to you? Oh, it's so funny that you mentioned the holiday because I just did a Facebook Live and my tree came. I, um, Christmas has always been a very big deal in our family. It's it's so funny because even though the family, we all live in different places now, we'll post things at Christmas time and we'll, we'll all have on our Christmas shirts and um, we have stuff from like Christmas vacation, the little mugs with the with the the deer stuff on it and everything and um it's always been a time when we would all get together and decorate the tree together i've had no tree for the last three years um i had ordered this tree with lights a long time ago and um, there was problems with them catching on fire so i i was without a tree for years and i finally decided to order another tree which came in and so i'm really excited about it i love the hallmark movies and i own like almost every christmas movie and in fact, my CD that's going to be coming out next year, Believe in a Seein, is actually that title is from the, the story, um, the Santa Claus, when uh, the elf is saying to him, uh, she says, "It's uh, it doesn't surprise me that you don't believe in Santa anymore, as when we grow up, we forget to believe." She goes, "Seeing isn't believing; believing is seeing," and that's how I actually came up with the idea for that particular song. So I just love Christmas. Wow. Okay. So we definitely have to talk about believing and seeing. Also, I couldn't help but notice that you have a song called Santa's Gone Country, right? Yes. And um, that song um, was on the charts last year. And every year I bring it back out. And it's a very special song to me because my mother came up with that idea. And I used to sing a lot at the Arbaland Hotel in Nashville. And I would call my mom on my breaks. And one time she mentioned that she came up with a song idea about Santa becoming country and like doing the whole country thing, <laughs> singing on the Opry. And and I loved the idea. And um, so we wrote this song called Santa's Gone Country. It's actually available on like, you know, Apple Music and Spotify and all. You can download it. It's a, um, a traditional kind of country sound to it. And um, I love playing it out around the holidays. That is awesome. You guys definitely have to check that out. Santa's Gone Country. So your new single feels like it's going to rain. I heard that when you heard it in this. OK, first of all, Carrie Underwood is one of the writers. Right. Yes. The song. Mm -hmm. And you did not know that she wrote it at first. But, but when you did hear the song, every time you heard it, you got really emotional. So can you just tell us all about the journey to you finding this song and, you know, realizing that it was a good fit and what the song is about? Yes. Um, I write a lot of my own material and with a lot of co-writers in Nashville. And one of my friends said, you know, why don't you think about putting a song on your record that's, you know, maybe something you didn't write just to embrace Music Row and embrace a lot of other writers. Um, and I said, sure, I'd love to hear other stuff. So she sent me this song that she had had for a long time that was sent to her. And it was a, it was actually a male vocalist singing it. And he had the most soulful voice. I have no idea who the singer was, but I would hear it and I would start to cry. And I just love this song. And, um, I actually took it to my vocal coach, Judy Rodman, and she was, well, let me hear you sing it. And she said, this song was meant for you. And so I went back to my friend and I said, you know, I decided I want to do the song. And so, you know, you have to get rights to sing the song, you know, um, get permission and all. And so we went through all that process. And when we did, that's when I found out that Carrie Underwood was one of the co-writers on that song, along with Barry Dean and Don Poitras. Mm -hmm. And so I had no idea. It was written back right after she had won Idol. And I don't know if, if they just passed up on the song at the time. You know, a lot of times you write a lot of songs and the producers decide what songs get chosen. But thank thank goodness uh, she didn't choose it because they gave me the opportunity to sing it and put it out on the radio. And so I just fell in love with that song. And the song is about, 
you know, I think everybody can relate to this song because it's about when you, you know, you love someone and you're kind of in love with them, but then you realize the relationship isn't working out. And you can just tell that day is coming when it's going to be over. And whether it's you that breaks it off or they break it off, it's like that. You just know it's going to happen, but you put it off. And that's what the singer is singing about in the song, you know, um, just saying, you know, it feels like it's going to rain. I, I don't want it to. I don't want this to end. But I kind of know that this is what it's coming to. I think most of us have had that time in our life when you, you go through a relationship, you really want it to work. And sometimes you even hang on longer than you probably should. But, you know, it's just not quite working out. Right. Yeah. It It, it sounds like it's one of those songs that leads to the whole we we need to talk like you get that inkling the dread yes. need to talk convo yeah so re you did go to school at berkeley like which is like major for anyone who is serious about music and everything i know that you grew up loving music music was like a big part of your household in new jersey did mm -hmm. you imagine that you would study it in school and then pursue it as a career you know i always wanted to do that. I think uh, since I was five years old, I remember I would, I love to swing outside on the swings and I would always have a radio with me and I'd listen to the music. And I remember asking my mom, you know, what do those people in the radio do for a living? And she said, honey, that's what they do. And I said, well, that's what I'm going to do. And then I started writing songs at nine years old. And then I got my first guitar around 12 years old. And um, I started taking lessons from this guy, Tony Pesh, and he introduced me to the Berkeley books. And so I started like um, what we call sight reading when you see the notes and you actually learn to play the notes from reading the music and learn solos that way and things. And, um, and then he introduced me to Wes Montgomery, which was a jazz guitarist. Um, he had, gave me an LP to listen to at home. I fell in love with with the jazz music. And um, it was after that that I actually thought about, hey, where do I want to go to school? You know, I wanted to go to school for music. And it was interesting because I was a very, uh, I, I was a 4.0 student in high school and I wanted to go for music, but I remember talking to the guidance counselor and they really tried to talk me out of it. You know, he made the comment, well, there are already is one Beatles. You know, you got really good grades. You need to be a lawyer or a doctor. Yeah. And I came home and I remember my dad called that day and even said, honey, how'd school go? And I said, oh, I went fine. You know, I'll, I'm going to probably be a doctor or a lawyer and he goes I thought you wanted to go for music I said well I do but the guidance counselor told me I need to do this and that's when my father said to me you need to follow your heart you know and what your passion is and um and Berkeley was up there on the list so you had to do an audition tape to, for Berkeley and I did that and I went to one of their summer camps and I just I fell in love with Berkeley Berkeley changed my life in so many ways because um I was kind of one of those kids that was mocked. I kind of followed the beat of my own drummer. I was kind of a loner and I dressed kind of different and I listened to music, you know, and I really didn't fit in. And when I went to Berkeley, it was like there was a bunch of people that were all different who were doing all kinds of different types of music. And there was no judgment. It was just you go and you be who you are. And um, it was just a great place for me to be and I really came out of my shell at Berkeley it, it, it really it changed my life and um, you know I'm just so grateful for that opportunity you know that is so powerful like because I think what you went through with your guidance counselor basically discourage discouraging your dreams is something that too many kids go through I would just like to know re why do you think it is important for children to have arts in the school if you do think that that's something that is important <laughs> I think it's very important, and uh, I hate to see, you know, when you hear that some schools don't have it, you know, I think we need to do more to have that because I, I do believe as we get older, sometimes we stop being as creative, you know, and I think that through the arts, it brings out our creativity, but also a way to express ourselves, and even people that, let's say you have, you know, painting in school, and maybe you may not even go on to be an artist, but it helps you to get out your emotions and create and discover. And uh, that's that's such an important part of who we are, whether we use it as therapy or whether we use it as something we go on to do on, a, you know, in, in business. Um, it just it, it's so therapeutic and it's good for the soul. It's, it's food for the soul, the arts. 
Yes, I, I so agree with that. So when you were at Berkeley and you found this community in which you felt like you could be yourself and everything, at what point did the opportunity for the music publishing deal come around and was it hard to walk away from that because I understand that you had that's when the great big opportunity for Uptown Girls came into play so. yeah um uh, that was actually a, a shocker I just I never really thought that I'd get a publishing deal and at the time there was a teacher there Pat Patterson who um he taught songwriting there mm -hmm. um I think now they have it as a major but back then they didn't it was just I took every one of his classes and everything he had on on lyric writing and um, he would even like take hit songs and we kind of take them apart and analyze them on why they were a good song and the lyrics and the music. And um, I just started, you know, sending to publishers my stuff. And that's when I got the um, in, in the mail the opportunity to do that. And actually, Pat actually went through the contract with me and made sure everything looked OK. And uh, that was for about a year, that contract. And then right around that time, um, I'd say probably within that same year, um, I did get the opportunity with Uptown Girls. And what happened there was it was actually two weeks before graduation, and I had no idea what I was going to do with my career. I didn't know if I was going to go back to New Jersey. I had no uh, no idea, and I was a little nervous about it. And we had a student mailbox, and in my mailbox there was this note. It was just this little written note that said they wanted me to audition for this all-female band. And so I called. And I remember taking the subway and taking all my stuff out and going out there um, to the suburbs of Boston and um, auditioning for this band. And they hired me on the spot. They had me wait and they had a little meeting. <laughs> like 10 minutes later, they came out and said, OK, you're in. I'm like, what? Like, I really didn't think they would hire me on the spot. And they said, yeah, we want you to be in the band. And they had an agent out of Florida. And so... I actually graduated two weeks later, stayed at one of the girls' houses um, with her parents and all out there in Boston, mm. and we we all we practiced like all day long every day for like I guess it was about a month, and we learned all these cover tunes, and um, and then we had all these gigs, and it was started out up and down the East Coast mostly. Then we had the opportunity to go overseas and play for the troops. And so we got to go to Japan and the Philippines and Singapore and play for troops all over. And it was um, it was a dream come true. I got to see a lot of the world, you know, um, being from New Jersey. I hadn't really traveled much except to New York and Philly. So it was um, besides being in Boston, you know, it was a chance for me to really travel and get paid for it and um, just see a lot of places and meet a lot of people and uh, it was just a really exciting experience, and uh, you know, I was in that band for a little over three years. What did you take from that experience of being in the Uptown Girls Band that you apply to where you where you are now in your career? I think that I learned a lot about entertaining on the stage. You know, I've been doing it since a young age. I used to be in musicals and everything, but I really learned in a in a band situation. You know, how to make that work and you know, what the people like and what the audience liked. And it was just like a lot of trial and error, trying different things and seeing what worked with people. And um, I think that uh, what always worked was being personable, you know, getting to know the audience. There were a lot of places, like I remember this one family in West Virginia, they actually took us in and would make us dinner. And uh, there were a lot of people that took us in. Um, I'll be forever grateful for that because when you're on the road all the time, you don't really get to see your family. We only took off for Christmas and Thanksgiving, and that is the only time we actually even got to go home. Otherwise, we traveled the rest of the time all year round. We were always traveling. So I, I learned a lot about making relationships you know, with people and, and the audience and, and how important they are. And, uh, just, uh, and, and also getting to have that band experience, you know, playing with other Good musicians. All the girls in that band were um, trained musicians. They all went to school for music. Um, and so it was a really neat opportunity. We did a lot of different style of music from Chicago, you know, to Duran Duran, just a little bit of everything. Can listeners expect to hear you playing on the guitar on your new album? Yes, um, I will be 
playing on some songs on that. And, uh, you know, I, I choose which ones I like to play on, uh, which, and whether I play, you know, lead, there'll be some lead, there'll be some acoustic guitar. But, and when I play live, um, I'm always playing guitar, whether it's the acoustic or electric. I really enjoy, um, playing, especially live. There's something about playing live. I think because I did it for so much live that there's something about the live audience that I just, I just love to see the faces of the people when you're, when you're playing your music. At that point, because you are obviously very seasoned, so do you still experience any nerves when you have to hit the stage? Yeah, I think I always get a little bit of butterflies. Um, but as soon as I start to sing, it all just dissipates and goes away. It's, it's really weird. I'll do a little butterflies before I go on. And then since I sing the first few notes, I just feel like I'm at home and then I, I don't want to leave the stage. Like I hate it when it's over. Cause I always considered playing on stage kind of like, uh, being in my living room, talking with people. You know, I like to see it as a more personable experience. I try to make contact with every eye that's out there because, uh, cause it is so important to me. Uh, and I am so grateful for the people that listen. You know, they have so many choices these days. And there's so many awesome artists out there that when people come out to, to hear me sing, I'm just grateful. Who are some of the artists that you enjoy listening to? You know, I grew up listening to um, a lot of your older, um, what you would call standard traditional country. So I still enjoy that kind of stuff, like Will and Jennings, you know, Tammy Wynette. I grew up with that. But I also enjoy uh, listening to like um, Linda Ronstadt. She was a biggie for me. I just as a female artist um, because she has such a versatile voice. You know, her range was really great. I mean, she even was in a Broadway play. Uh, just really versatile and doing pop and country. Um, and I, I love to listen to that. Uh, but I also like the, the new artists of today, like Maren Morris. I really enjoy, you know, her stuff and, um, John Party. There's a lot of good artists out there I love to listen to that are out there right now too. That's great. So you, you mentioned versatility, which is what, which is what you like. What else do you like? What else makes somebody an artist that Ree Mate likes to listen to? Um, I think it's, uh, their material, you know, a lot of times it's the song, yeah. like, uh, I'll give you an example, Miranda Lambert's song, Automatic. Mm. Um, I hear that song and it brings me back. I mean, my parents used to make sun tea in the window and that's in that song, you know, and, uh, my uncle Carl had an old rambler with, you know, the windows that just rolled up and down and it, it just brings back memories. And so a lot of times it's not just the artist, but it's the song. And, and what it reminds me of, you know, what it brings back memories for me and what I can relate to. Uh, and I think that's what a lot of people like to hear is if they can relate to it in some way, you know, that artist, the way they, I guess, communicate and bring across that song in a way that makes you feel like you're there with them. By the way, I do. I really like your song, Bump, Bump, Bump. Oh, thank you. I, that, that song was from a, a personal experience. Uh, I went through a breakup and, uh, when I, I used to go out to the clubs a lot and dance. And that's how I would get over a breakup. All my girlfriends and me would go out and we'd dance and I'd listen to the music. And it was always the music that got me through. Music has been such an important part of my life through all the good times, but also the hard times. And I think that when people hear a sad song and they hear the beat of that music and they know that person writing that song knows what I'm going through. And that person singing that song knows what I'm going through and they got through it. So I'll get through it too. And that's what, that's what bump 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 is all about. Yes. It, it's so catchy. And it's also, <laughs> it's, it's very empowering too. Like, I, thank you. Thank you. Cause I wanted it to be, you know, a lot of times I sing these sad songs sometimes, but I, I want them to be empowering too, to know that, even if you go through a, a hard time or a sad time, you know, sometimes that opens up the door for something better that you wouldn't have been able to have, you know, if you didn't go through that to begin with. Hey, talk about it. Talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And Rhi, I also can. Well, by the way, I just really get the vibe that you are such a positive person, like even just like seeing you in an interview, like online and stuff and speaking with you. And then also you post positive and uplifting quotes do you have any favorites um i love any quote by tony robbins um and then there you know you'll see some dolly parton ones on there because dolly parton 
there's something about her that any time I've ever seen her in an interview, and if you hear her story about how she was raised, she is such a positive person. And you can, and she seems so grateful when you hear her interview. She's just so grateful to the fans and to be able to do the music. And so I love her, any of her quotes and Tony Robbins quotes because, you know, I love to hear stories of people that have struggled and then you see their quotes and, um, it has a lot to do with how you, how you speak to yourself and your inner voice and how you train yourself when you, when you say things, um, to, to know that you, you know, you can get through these things and to, to see other people that have gone through difficult times and have gotten through them is uplifting for everyone. And that's what I want my quotes to be. And I, that's what I like my Instagram and everything. Um, my social media to be for people is a place where they can, can, uh, feel uplifted and, and know there's always hope, you know. So when can people expect believing and seeing? You said next year, right? Yeah, next year, um, we don't have an exact date yet, but probably near spring, um, February, March, somewhere in that neighborhood is when we're planning on it coming out. You know, we always have to look at, there's a lot that goes into when you release a, a single, you know, we want it to be the right timing and the, the next single um, is going to be a more um, up-tempo and rocking out a little bit. And so we're really excited about it. So I think that people are going to really enjoy the next single and uh, something a little less sad <laughs> for the next one. <laughs> well, that's exciting. Mm -hmm. Would you ever see yourself transitioning beyond country or just adding other sounds as well to your career? Um, yeah, I think there'll always be that country underlying tone. Mm -hmm. But I do do some things that are a little more soulful. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I've done some Bonnie Raitt covers and things like that. I, I do see that. And um, I also enjoy acting. I've done a little bit of acting, and uh, that's something that I'd like to pursue a little bit more, too, in the, in the future. You know, I see myself doing a little bit of that along with the music. Um, but I think there'll always be some of the country roots, you know, in there along with it. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, you're very talented, like, in terms of the different things that you do. You were also a nurse at one point. Yes, yes, and I do. I still still do nursing as a nurse practitioner, part a part of the time. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's it's um, it's a, it's something that I always dreamed of doing that I wanted to help people, and um, it's uh it's something I'm grateful to be able to do um, to help and give back, you know, in a way that uh, that is just um something that it's hard to put into words, but. Um, when, when someone has something going on and, and you help them, whether it's their diabetes, you know, there's a lot of diabetes these days and more and more people being diagnosed with diabetes. It's an epidemic now. When you help get people, uh, their blood sugars under control and, and they are, they feel better and they're healthy again. It's, um, it's just, uh, I feel very, um, humbled, um, to be able to be a part of that in someone's life. Would you ever write a book? You know, it's funny you say that because I, I think about writing a book. Um, I read a lot of, um, of autobiographies and biographies. I love to hear people's stories, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I have thought about that. I love to write. Um, I've done a lot of, you know, writing and poems and things like that besides the songwriting. Mm -hmm. What goes into a songwriting session, particularly when you are working with other songwriters as well? That's a that's a good question because they're all a little different because everybody writes a little a little different. Like for me, I don't actually pick up my guitar when I write. A lot of people do, and I uh, I'm a member of the NSAI National Songwriters Association, and I went to one of their song camps one time, and they talked about just putting down your instrument when you're writing because sometimes you go to the same chords and you tend to write the same kind of things. So um, I usually go into a session. I'll have my guitar with me, but I'll wait, not usually pick it up at first. And I always have a, a book of ideas. I keep an ongoing book of ideas. A lot of times when I'm driving in the car, I'll just record ideas. Sometimes it'll be a melody. Sometimes it'll be just a thought of, or a song title. And I keep that and I keep a book of ideas. Um, and I always go into a session with ideas. And what usually happens is I'll come in with some ideas and sometimes other people will. And then it'll just depend on um, what I do we feel like writing that day. And um, sometimes I'm writing for a CD. 
for myself, but sometimes I, I want to write for other people. And so I try to, you know, take off the artist hat and just write from a songwriting perspective. A lot of times, not always for me, but for who knows who it might be for, or maybe sometimes the other person that I'm writing with, because I write with other artists too that are putting out CDs. And so, um, I'll do that. And then usually we just come up with the, you know, the chorus and then we'll come up with the uh, verses. And a lot of times we'll, sometimes we'll finish it that day. Sometimes we'll get stuck or be like, you know, we have a couple good verses here. Let's, then we'll finish it by email. Uh, sometimes we do it that way or get back together and finish the song. Uh, and it's really neat to write with different people because um, everyone has different ways of writing. You know, some people, they just sing it on t- into their phone. Some people like to write it down. I like to, to write it on paper and put it in my phone because I have so many electronics that have failed me in the past. Mm, but yeah. I like to have a backup plan, you know, mm. so I, I, I like to do both. Reed Matei, everyone. Oh, my God, Reed, I could, like, keep talking to you <laughs> <laughs> like, nonstop, really. Um, thank you so much for talking to So Booking Cool today. It was so great, and I would love to have you on again in the future. Thank you, and I thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you, and I appreciate everyone that listens. Thank you so much. Oh, Rimate, of course. How can people keep up with you? I am on uh, Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, uh, YouTube, and it's um, R-E, R-E, and then Mate, M-A-T-T-E-I. You can find me out there. Yes. And by the way, we I really like your name a lot. Like, would you call it a stage name, even though it is? You know, you know, it was my name growing up. My grandmother always called me that name. And then I kind of grew out of it as I got older. And then uh, later on, I just started calling myself that again. My grandmother passed away mm-hmm. and it reminded me of her. And so when people call me, it reminds me of my grandmother. So it always gives me a warm place in my heart. But yeah, that's very touching. Rimate. I always welcome my guests to share any final thoughts that they might have. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Just that um, if you if you have a dream or you have a passion, you know, no matter what anybody tells you, if you really truly believe that's what you're supposed to be doing, then go for it because you just never know where life may may take you and and who you might meet and and the uh, the giving back you can give along the way. Um, you'll you'll get something out of it, but you'll also give back to people in ways that you never thought were possible. Thank you to all the listeners, and until next time, so booking cool.